Um, so again, uh, for people who need to know the rules of engagement, this is our last of the series of summer grand rounds. Um, next week, there will not be medical grand rounds. And then after Labor Day, we will start our regular weekly uh, grand rounds. Uh, the subject will not always be COVID. Um, I think our first one is uh, on uh, is a case conference, um, which relates to uh, lung cancer screening. If there are major COVID updates, um, I will try to carve out time from some of these existing grand rounds uh, to do those. Um, but the plan will be to go back to our regular scheduled grand rounds, which will be a variety of uh, topics. Um, so uh, the rules here are that only the panelists are able to show their video and uh, audio. Um, if you want to ask questions, please use the uh, Q&A button that's on the bottom of your screen. Um, the panelists will be able to see the questions and will either answer them online or I will ask the questions of the presenters at the end. So I see that our number of participants has gone up to uh, 78, 79. I imagine it will keep going up for the next minute or two. So with that, um, I'm going to start with a brief epidemiology update uh, by Dr. Lesher. Uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Patak, uh, for the opportunity to address it. When, when Dr. Patak and Dr. Sandy, Sandy excuse me, um, it, uh, asked me to do the introduction again th this week for epidemiology, I said, what for? There's really no update. And that's in COVID land and public health, sometimes that's a good thing. Boy, was I wrong. A lot can change over uh, 24 to 48 hours. And I'm gonna to try to address two questions that I got emailed from viewers from the last rounds that, um, that are important and kind of address why, or, or speak to a little bit why this is kind of a sad day in public health. When, we, when I last addressed you guys, we were talking about the, you know, the softening of guidelines for school reopening. We see recently as, as the lab as infectious disease here at RGH and everywhere struggle with the upcoming flu season about how to uh, prioritize and how to uh, algorithmatize our testing strategy in the likely setting of a shortage of lab reagents when we're going to be looking at flu and RSV and COVID potentially all at the same time. Against that back, and we continue to struggle with that, and we have ongoing meetings, including with incident command. Against that backdrop, the CDC recently further relaxed their guidelines recently about testing requirements and about quarantine from other coming from other states. And uh, the, as far as we know, and according to Dr. Uh, Zucker, uh, the healthcare commissioner for uh, New York State, there's no new evidence, no scientific evidence that that is cited for this change, which really makes it difficult for public health. And one of the questions that came in that I was referring to was that, uh, where can uh, primary care physicians and, and, and generalists and, and people and pediatricians who are on the front lines, where can they go for neutral scientifically based guidelines? as we see in a world of increasing politicalization. Who would have thought wearing a mask is debatable in the setting of a pandemic? That's where we are. Um, and, and it's critical to remember as, as, as frustrating and as depressing as some, some of these developments are, that people still trust their family doctors, their general internal medicine people, their pediatricians the most. So when you have vaccine hesitancy already at play and, and driving the measles outbreaks that we've seen, and you have anti-vaccination groups that are well-voiced and well-versed on the technosphere, and, and, and you have a recent poll that showed from 40% of Americans who were surveyed said they wouldn't get the COVID vaccine now, 
over a slight majority of 51% saying that, um, times are very concerning. And so uh, that's, that's where we are. So the, another important question that was asked is, how is this change in guidance going to change insurance compensation for when providers order a test? I don't know. I can only assume it's going to be a negative test because if you're not familiar with the new guidance, it says, well, if you're exposed to somebody that has COVID, if you had close contact for 15 minutes, you know, the other definition, you can consider getting tested, but you don't have to get tested. Uh, this is going to make it very hard to do contact tracing to get so and if there's no recommendation, if there's no strong recommendation to get a test, it's likely that the, some insurance companies could use that as a way uh, not to pay for it. Uh, so another question was uh, from somebody who must be well into the weeds more than I am about the epidemiologic data, is that they say, hey, when I look at the data from the New York State about hospitalizations and about mortality and about cases, and I compare that to the data on the Montgomery, on the Monroe County website, I always see a consistent uh, discordance, discrepancy. What causes that? And is it that uh, a different set of data is reported to through the HERDS survey, which is what I need, or is it, and one is, is a different set of data being reported to the state versus the county level? And there are three, at least three possible explanations for the discrepancy besides a time lag. And the first answer is no. I could speak to what we do at RGH and RRH. The, the people who collect the data on terms of daily COVID rates at the hospital admissions report the exact same data to the state as to the county in, in their herd survey. And that's there. But where the disconnect is, once it gets to the respective agencies, they handle the data difference in, differently in terms of deduplication. So if you're readmitted to the hospital within a week, or so, or or even longer um, for a non-related, a non-related COVID problem. Like you're going to get an elective surgery or procedure, and you get a positive test, but you were previously positive. Some agencies will count that as a new. They don't do deduplicate that. So that that's one reason. Another reason is some agencies only count count everybody in the hospital that ever had a diagnosis of COVID while others after some people, like for example, you're gonna hear later about the ICU, the great ICU success here at RGH. Um, that, that said, many people are in the hospital for a long time, but they meet discontinuation precautions and that the flag comes down. And so some, some agencies still count those people and some agencies no longer consider that a, a COVID on the COVID census when that. So that uh, hopefully will answer those questions. Um, and um, so, th so that was that. that they're the main updates that I that I wanted to say. I also, in addition to pointing out, you know, and, and so where can you get the the evidence that that the that the viewer asked? I, I think I think the the state is still reliable. The state public health uh, as states are reliable. I think university based uh, things like just the the global public health run by Harvard. I, we, in, in, in my old life, we did uh, antimicrobial surveillance. We always looked to the Europeans who, who were well ahead of us in surveillance for that respect. So you're, you got the European CDC, you got uh, Australian uh, CDC who, who are highly qualified. Um, and, and so you, you could look around, there, there is available evidence, but because the patients treat you guys most, um, it, you know, my, my hat's off to you. My other uh, a thank you is to the hospitalists who help us drive our county rates, which were really skyrocketing down. Uh, and that's, that's very important because it will help the hospital avoid a fine. Um, and so, I, you know, there's a lot of reasons why it's coming down, but I think we've had some great interactions with the hospitalist group and others, other groups. Uh, and in the recent IPC meeting with the data, it was very promising. So thank you. With the flu season coming up and the flu vaccine being uh, starting to become available, it's crucial that everybody encourage their patients to get the flu shot and get the flu shot themselves. And you can get it earlier. I know there's a debate that if I get it too early, then it'll wane. I mean, but we don't know. There's always a gamble. Uh, if the flu season has an early peaking thing, you're going to be benefiting by, by that uh, if you get it earlier. But, but what we're worried about is, is, is a lot of admissions really stressing the system. Um, 
because of, of, of uh, you know, viral, uh, respiratory viral illnesses uh, in flu and COVID. And there was a nice study that came out that, uh, that showed, regardless of the efficacy of, a, of, of, of the vaccine, of the flu vaccine, readmission rates, this study showed that 30-day readmission rates were significantly lower in the people who got the vaccine. Uh, and readmission is, a, is an important metric as well. So um, more to follow on our testing recommendations, hopefully soon. And with that, uh, let's again, thank all you guys and, and thanks Dr. Paddock for the opportunity to, uh, to, to give you guys. Thank you, Dr. Thanks. Lesho, we'll have uh, the slides go up. Um, yeah, I just wanna underscore the importance of the flu vaccine this year more than ever. Uh, we, we need people to do that. Uh, we have that vaccine. Um, we need to be encouraging that, absolutely. All right. You can start, Dr. Bopana. So uh, Dr. Bopana and uh, Dr. Salem will be presenting, uh, starting with a couple of cases, uh, one of our, some of our sickest patients in ICU, and then uh, go over uh, different presentations, diagnosis, and uh, management aspects. Uh, and uh, Dr. Bopana, you want to start? My name is um, Teja Bopono. I'm one of the second year residents. So I'll just begin this presentation. Um, this is a brief agenda for today's um, medical grand rounds. We're discussing respiratory failure in COVID, both in um, uh, patients admitted to the general medical floor as well as the ICU with a focus on um, VB ECMO that was utilized here at Rochester General. Um, so brief introduction, many of us are familiar with this, uh, but essentially coronavirus, as we know, belongs to the beta coronavirus genus. It is one of the three coronaviruses which replicates in the lower respiratory tract and can cause pneumonia. Uh, transmission, as well as we're also aware, primarily respiratory droplets from face-to-face -face contact and to a lesser extent, contaminated surfaces. Aerosol spread may occur, but the role is unclear and the majority of transmission is due to pre-symptomatic carriers. Common symptoms in hospitalized patients, uh, which we which uh, we ask, and which is com uh, which fever seventy to ninety percent, dry cough, shortness of breath and fatigue, as well as myalgias, GI symptoms, rhinorrhea and, and osmia are also known to occur and are reported. Um, there is also a recent study that presyncope was one of the presenting um, um, complaints for people with COVID. I think ten to twelve percent of people were came in with presyncope. Um, this is as of this morning at 6 a.m. Um, uh, in the U.S., there are uh, 5.7 million odd case, confirmed cases of COVID with about 170,000 deaths. New York State has about 436,000 with 32,000 deaths and Monroe County with 5,125 cases and 289 deaths. In the last one week, actually, there have been no deaths reported and this is based on the Monroe County dashboard um, for COVID. Um, so getting on to the case presentation, so since uh, mid-March, when we had our first case admitted to the ICU to about uh, one week ago, um, so it's, there have been about 92 COVID patients admitted, so the number is 92 as of now, and um, we, we actually did a retrospective analysis between mid-March to the end of April, uh, a study which was recently published as well. So in this, uh, we looked at initially 32 patients, but we um, increase this uh, number to, we, this published study had 32 patients, but we did analysis for 50 patients in which the average age of patients was 64 years with the range being 37 to 84 years of age. 66% um, of people, uh, patients admitted were male and um, they were in the hospital from, from the day of admit to maybe 24 days prior. And the length of stay varied from one day to up to 50 days. Mortality was 22%. And at the time we did this study, uh, one of the reasons we actually did looked at the data was because the mortality reported was very high. And we actually found a discordance in that at least Rochester Regional at the time, we seemed to be better prepared. That was one of the theories we said, because mortality was a bit lower than what was um, mentioned in the media at the time. So it was for 32 patients, there was about 16%, but when we looked at 50 patients, there was around 22%. Um, since, since the last five, six, five months, 
Um, we've had a total of six patients utilize ECMO, but out of these four patients uh, used BV ECMO for uh, respiratory failure due to COVID. The other two patients were uh, patients who had COVID but was, were not related to respiratory failure due to this. So I, we wouldn't really uh, count those in, into, our, uh, into this talk today, the, those two patients that is. Um, so out of the four, three patients were actually discharged home and one, um, one died. So this is the first case that we'll, uh, we'll discuss. Um, a 49-year-old male, um, this, he presented to the hospital in the first week of, uh, this was the first week of April. He was known to be type 2 diabetes, um, A1, HbA1c of 9%, not on insulin, uh, who presented with cough, shortness of breath, fever, and myalgias. He had returned from New York City a few days prior to uh, coming into hospital, and at the time, um, the, the, the thought was the exposure while, while, was while he was commuting over there. He was coronavirus positive by PCR on the day of admission, and um, we checked inflammatory markers on the uh, day of admission. Um, his D-dimer was 800, um, LDH 290, ferritin and CRP were both elevated. He was initially um, triaged and admitted to the medicine floors, and um, day two, he was hypoxemic, um, requiring um, more than eight liters of oxygen, and he, was, and he ended up being triaged to the medical ICU. Uh, over, over the next few days, um, he was intubated, um, recruitment maneuvers were done, he was, and then he ended up being paralyzed, but there was no improvement in his respiratory status. Uh, we ended up uh, doing prone ventilation for him. Uh, we used inhaled vasodilators, but the PF ratio remained very low at 71. Uh, at that time, given um, he, he, was, well, he met all the criteria for VV ECMO, which we'll discuss later on, and the um, decision was made to be placed on VV ECMO for refractory hypoxemia on day five, and um, he remained on VV ECMO until day 23 of admission. Um, during during this time he had a tracheostomy done on day 16 um, and tracheostomy was decannulated on day 32. He was discharged to acute rehab on day 51 and home on day 59. Um, during his hospital courses with most with, with someone in the ICU for such a prolonged period of time, um, he ended up de developing pneumonia and acute kidney injury um, for which uh, we had to do um, CRRT. And at this time, the medications which we now know are not proven to be effective uh, we did use tocilizumab as well as hydroxychloroquine and um, IV steroids. The steroids we used at that time were methylprednisone. Uh, so this was one of our patients who actually made it home um, from, from, my, from the ICU. Uh, the second case, a 51-year-old male with no past medical history, present, similar uh, presenting complaint, worsening cough, shortness of breath and fevers, uh, no clear exposure was identified, no, no travel, uh, if I remember correctly, he was also quarantining at home at the time this happened. Um, was coronavirus positive um, on admission, and um, his he had a very high ferritin, 5,000, and elevated CRP. Also admitted to the medicine floors, very similar to the first case, and um, due to hypoxemia, went to the medical ICU on day two. Uh, repeat inflammatory markers showed that the D-dimer was uh, significantly elevated, over 7,000 and the ferritin and CRP remained elevated. Um, the, he, he can, we once again did everything we do in terms of management for ARDS. He was, um, you know, we followed the ARDS uh, net criteria. Uh, we proned him, we used inhaled vasodilators. He still remained hypoxemic and um, the PF ratio was low um, in the night, was in the 90s for this gentleman. Um, so once again, he met the criteria for VV ECMO um, uh, which, which are pretty strict and rigid. And he ended up going on VV ECMO on day seven, five days after being in the ICU. Um, he remained on VV ECMO for until day 24, um, had a tracheostomy done again, decannulated on day 40, and he was um, discharged at home actually, straight from the hospital through all of this, um, did pretty well. Um, complications during his hospital course, he ended up developing seizures, um, and um, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Uh, medications used, again, were similar to what was being offered to all patients at the time, tocilizumab, hydroxychloroquine, and IV steroids. Um, so, um, I'll, so we have some images that Dr. O'Hara will briefly describe. These are the chest um, imaging findings for these patients. 
So before we go to imaging, just one quick uh, point. Tocilizumab was used, uh, total we used about five patients and was reserved for very severe inflammatory uh, process, inflammatory markers. And uh, we had to have two infectious disease consultants and at least one pulmonary care, critical care consultant agree upon giving it. Uh, a recent study just, uh, again, the whole study didn't come out, but uh, there was in the news that uh, the primary outcome data on tocilizumab was uh, not effective. So we are not using it in everybody, but of course these two patients were very severely ill and had inflammatory markers through the roof. So total five patients got tocilizumab. So Dr. O'Heron, you wanna go, can you go to the next slide? Okay, good morning. Um, and everybody knows Dr. O'Heron. Uh, he's uh, one of our chest radiologists. Um, and uh, we go to him for all of our, all of our cases, not just a <laughs> He's too kind. He's too kind. Um, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Yeah, I'm the uh, section chief of thoracic imaging, for those who don't know me. Um, and I'm happy to, uh, to be here. So um, I want to talk a little bit about um, just imaging in coronavirus uh, in general, um, and then I'll speak to the images. So I think it'll just sort of give us a little bit of a background of what we're looking for um, or what you might be looking for, you know, when you, when you have a, a patient who you're suspecting uh, has COVID. And it's a work in progress um, from, from a radiology standpoint, as I'm sure it is from, from other specialties as well. <clears throat> what we know about it so far is not to, uh, to uh, complicate things right off the bat, but that it can look like anything, unfortunately. So it can look like anything from a normal chest x-ray or a completely normal CT to diffuse opacities and anywhere in between. So that's really the reason why you may see recommendations out there, hopefully people have seen this, where we're not recommending it being used as a screening test for COVID or even really as a diagnostic test. Um, because it's very, the, the findings can be very nonspecific. That being said, the good news is that we've come to the conclusion that we do have some findings on, on radiographs and CT where in the appropriate clinical setting, we can suggest coronavirus. Um, and that appropriate clinical setting uh, goes back to, the, to you guys, to the clinicians to tell us, hey, you know, we're really worried about coronavirus here for whatever reason. You know, a positive test obviously, you know, helps out a lot. But even, you know, if you told us that, you know, they have the symptoms, you know, the fever and et cetera that, that, that we see and that you're, you know, you think they've had an exposure, anything you can put in the rec, um, you know, that helps us or, or sort of points us and guides us towards that diagnosis is helpful. So what are the findings that we, that we are seeing, uh, quote unquote, commonly in these patients? Um, the main thing we see is airspace disease, right? And airspace disease is very, very nonspecific. But um, that combined with, co with what's called ground glass opacity, which is um, basically alveolar disease that's just not as dense. So alveolar disease tends to be very dense, tends to be very patchy and confluent with air bronchograms, the usual uh, pneumonia that everyone thinks about. Um, and But it can have uh, a, a sort of a lighter feel to it where it's not as dense. Uh, and that's really what we call ground glass. And there, there's a lot more detail to that, but that, that's basically what ground glass is. <clears throat> and then what actually is interesting is that uh, the distribution of the opacities helps us a pretty good amount with coronavirus and trying to trying to nail down the diagnosis. And that distribution is peripheral and basilar predominant. So when we see opacities that are very peripheral, what we call strikingly peripheral, and, uh, and, and you may see the term subplural, that basically means the same thing. And basilar predominant, meaning that as you uh, as you go from the from the top of the image down, you see more and more opacities from apex to base, and that they tend to be a little more peripheral. That's kind of the 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 main thing we look for um, when we're worried about coronavirus. So patchy peripheral basilar predominant opacities, but keeping in mind the fact that they can it can really look like anything, um, and uh, and even a normal uh, X-ray, you know, or a CT uh, uh, can still be seen in a, in a patient with coronavirus. 
what are some atypical things that we don't usually see in these patients uh, that kind of steers us away from coronavirus, if, if that's a clinical question? Well, we normally don't see things like cavitation, as far as we know. We normally don't see a lot of adenopathy. We normally don't see pleural effusions, okay, and nodularity within the lung parenchyma. So when we, when we see those things, you know, we tend to think that it probably is not coronavirus. But again, work in progress, and we're still trying to figure out you know, all of these patients and, and sort of stratify them by our imaging findings. But in general, those are the things that if we see, um, you know, we're thinking that it's, that it's probably not coronavirus. The other thing that we see with coronavirus patients is something called interlobular septal thickening, and that's um, the curly B lines that everyone thinks about, uh, hopefully most people have heard about with things like pulmonary edema. Okay, curly B lines uh, are very nonspecific um, and, uh, and they can be seen in a variety of processes, but, uh, but we're seeing that in coronavirus, um, sometimes we will see that. Um, and then of course that overlaps with things like edema, et cetera. So just to give you a background in terms of what we're thinking about um, when we look at images and, and what were the conclusions we're trying to come to, but again, as always in radiology, you know, it really goes back to clinical history and, and, and what you guys are, are thinking. Um, so to discuss the, uh, the specific patient, so um, this is the first patient. This is the initial film we had on, on uh, March 26th. Um, and you can see right away, and I, hopefully uh, these images are going to project well for people. I know that they're kind of small, but um, we have patchy alveolar opacities. Okay, so that's all of this confluent, dense, uh, white stuff in the lungs, and it's peripheral predominant. Okay, and we, when we say peripheral predominant, we don't mean that there's nothing central. We just mean that, that mo as you go out to the periphery of the lungs that you sort of see more. Oh, thank you. Okay, I'm pointing on my screen and <laughs> maybe people can't, uh, can't see me pointing. Okay, so um, yes, so, so that, so more strike, you know, sort of peripheral uh, is what we're looking for. And then when we, so, so this is the initial film, okay? And the initial film has a differential, and a lot of these patients will have a differential diagnosis, unfortunately, from us. Um, again, not a screening test, right? Not even really a diagnostic test. We kind of have to throw in a gamut of, of differentials. So, you know, multifocal pneumonia, pulmonary edema, a little strange because of the pattern, okay? Pulmonary hemorrhage, also a bit strange, okay? But more importantly, higher on the differential in patients with coronavirus is when we include stuff that's in that peripheral differential, like organizing pneumonia, eosinophilic pneumonia, even septic emboli, if it looks a little nodular on, on the x-ray. And we just got done saying that coronavirus usually isn't nodular. So, so those are the things that we'll include in our differential in these patients. So on the follow-up film, um, unfortunately, uh, things are getting a bit worse. So um, even though some of the opacities in the periphery look like they're clearing a little bit, we actually have more disease centrally. So now the patient is going on to more of an ARDS type picture um, where we're getting, this is, this is a patient with coronavirus with now diffuse opacities, right? So again, can be peripheral. Now we're much more diffuse. Um, and you can see the Hopefully the, the lines and tubes project, I don't know how well they project, but there's the ECMO catheter uh, projecting there uh, along the, the right heart body, yeah, right there. So, so now the patient's on ECMO and unfortunately doing, doing worse. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, so this is <clears throat> the patient on June 19th um, uh, where the patient has recovered and you can see that markedly, uh, markedly improved um, uh, on the radiograph. So what we're really left with now, they're not out of the woods totally in terms of the parenchyma. So I don't know how well be, people can see this, but we're left with coarse reticular opacity. So all of these lines, these extra lines, and then yes, if you go to the upper, mid to upper lung zones as well, yeah, all of that. And even on the left, uh, more superiorly, yep, yeah, very good. So those, that's all uh, coarse reticular opacity and probably a bit of bronchiectasis as well. Um, I know it may not project too well. So, you know, we're keeping an eye on these patients and seeing how they progress radiographically uh, in terms of fibrotic change. Um, and unfortunately, right now, it's a little bit of a difficult thing to predict who is going to go on to develop a lot of fibrotic change and who isn't. Um, but this is a patient that, uh, that is certainly much better in terms of, of the acute process, but, but may very well be left with, you know, some chronic changes. Uh, next slide, please. 
Okay, this is an initial patient. This is the CAT scan, um, uh, an image where we're sort of looking at the apices, uh, apices bilaterally, and you can see patchy alveolar disease. The alveolar disease is that much more dense opacity. And then the ground glass opacity, which is where his arrow is uh, right there posteriorly at the left apex, um, that uh, uh, actually a little more posterior, yeah, if you just go kind of back a little bit on the image. Um, there you go. Yeah, so that stuff is the ground glass. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> Okay, so we just have a couple cuts a little bit lower. So you can see at the, at the image on the right, we're at the level of the carina. And we're seeing again, just patchy, um, diffuse, mixed alveolar and ground glass opacities with some air bronchograms. So that's what you see on the, yep, that's what you see on the, on the radiograph. So, um, so those are air bronchograms. So this is, this is a, a patient, uh, as we know, as coronavirus um, and some of the opacities um, uh, are, are somewhat peripheral, although at this point they're, they're uh, starting to become central as well. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Okay, so a few cuts a little bit lower down, same patient. Um, and again, we have patchy bilateral ground glass and, and alveolar opacities. And I know this may not, uh, uh, you know, present very well, but there's septal thickening as well. So particularly within that right lung, uh, interlobular septal thickening anteriorly and laterally. Yeah, so, um, so that's some of the septal thickening that we see in these patients. Next slide, please. Okay, this is the second case uh, that was presented. So um, the April 1st and April 2nd uh, uh, x-rays um, on the April 1st uh, radiograph, we see that there are patchy alveolar opacities, again, with a peripheral uh, predominant pattern, particularly you can see it at the right lung base, where his arrow just was, and now on the left side uh, as well. So we have some uh, peripheral opacities. Uh, incidentally, uh, on that film, the feeding tube, unfortunately, is in the right lower low bronchus. Um, and you can see the distended stomach as well. So, uh, and that was, that was fixed. So good job uh, fixing that. So April 2nd, um, uh, we have a repositioned uh, uh, enteric tube and, and uh, we, now we have the patients intubated. Um, we have a, a, a patchy opacities again. Now, unfortunately, um, uh, progressed, you know, even over the day uh, between the two radiographs, uh, you can see that that we have more opacities now centrally where his arrow is um, with air bronchograms. Uh, and even on the left, hiding behind the heart, so hiding behind that cardiac silhouette, um, there's actually a, a more opacities as well. So unfortunately progressing on April 2nd. Next slide, please. Okay, so now um, again, now we're on April 14th, so you know we're a few weeks or so later, um, and uh, marked progression, unfortunately. So now we are to the point where, yes, still strikingly peripheral of your opacities, but again, a lot of disease centrally as well. We have our bronchograms, um, so unfortunately, uh, you know, going down, uh, unfortunately, uh, um, a worse pathway. The April 21st film, um, maybe a little bit of progression. You know, it's a little difficult. The lungs are a little more underinflated. So we do have um, some pretty moderate to severe opacities at this point. Again, more diffuse, but we do have some that are a little more confluent along the periphery of both lungs. Um, so unfortunately, we're, uh, we're progressing. The patient is, uh, has a tracheostomy tube at this point. Um, so we know that, uh, that unfortunately, we're progressing into more of an ARDS type picture. I believe that's all we have for uh, imaging. Yes, that, that's it, Dr. O'Hara. OK, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Um, briefly, uh, moving on to clinical presentation um, for COVID-19. Mean incubation period is approximately five days with uh, almost 97% developing symptoms within 12 days of infection. Uh, symptomatic infection as we know, ranges from mild to severe and can affect single or multi-systems. Um, this, this talk is mainly centered around respiratory failure and ERDS, which we know is a feared complication of COVID-19. But other major systems that are affected, um, the cardiac and cardiovascular system, the cardiovascular system, generally speaking, uh, we have myocardial infarctions, we've seen myocarditis, arrhythmias arising, and even cardiogenic shock as a result. And um, over, time we also maybe april may we realized that it was also um causing thromboembolisms um in, putting people at a risk of dvt pe and um, even stroke and people less than the age of 50 who didn't have any acute who didn't have risk factors for this 
So evaluation, what do we usually, or what do we typically do for someone who comes in to the hospital? Um, uh, we check the, uh, the uh, coronavirus PCR and presentation. Um, once confirmed, uh, we check a CBC with diff looking for lymphopenia, uh, renal function, liver function. Um, we have um, cases where COVID-19 affects um, the kidneys um, and, uh, and then the D-dimer, ferritin, CRP, and LDH, which are inflammatory markers. Uh, we trend the markers while the patient is hospitalized. Uh, we, we've generally found that as uh, patients who have similar markers or they don't improve, they remain stable, actually do better than people who are where, where their markers are increasing. We find that the, they get more hypoxemic. Um, procalcitonin uh, is so COVID-19 is a viral pneumonia. Uh, we usually think of procalcitonin as a marker in bacterial pneumonia and We've seen where we've seen many patients where procalcitonin is elevated. This doesn't necessarily mean that there's bacterial pneumonia, but um, it's just it's just increased due to systemic inflammation. However, you know it does help if there's a suspicion for a superimposed bacterial pneumonia to kind of help guide us with antibiotics. So it, it's not something we routine. It's something we check, but an elevated procalcitonin shouldn't help make you decide on antibiotics if there is no other suspicion for bacterial pneumonia. Um, chest imaging is we do. Uh, we always do an x-ray to begin with. Um, CT, CT imaging is not always needed. Uh, and we do the chest radiograph to kind of track progression at least um, based to monitor their uh, respiratory status. The role of echocardiogram, we do not routinely obtain echocardiograms in patients with COVID-19 unless you were to suspect that there was something um, going on. Um, if suspected bacterial infection, um, we always send sputum um, or tracheal aspirate and blood cultures. Uh, I, will, I will discuss um, management of patients um, with COVID-19 on the general medicine floors and then um, um, Salim, um, the, my, my colleague, will discuss for ICU patients. So patients admitted to the general medicine floor, uh, usually it's supportive care. The primary goal here is we're supporting them and hoping that monitoring their oxygenation really, uh, making ensuring their SpO2 remains between 92 and 98 percent. And if it's worsening um, above six liters or higher, we, we would consider um, getting pulmonology on board. Um, an ICU consult um, for about eight liters. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily mean that they need to go to the medical ICU, but they can go to the step down unit if needed, if they end up going on high flow nasal cannula and so on, which we will discuss later on. Uh, in terms of um, medications, which we can offer now for any patients based on the most re uh, recent um, recovery trial um, done in the UK, uh, they, they gave dexamethasone to all patients hospitalized with COVID-19. But the study actually shows that it's beneficial for patients who had um, beneficial for, for those patients who needed oxygen at some level. Here, um, anyone who needs two liters of oxygen or more, uh, it's very reasonable to start dexamethasone. We do six milligrams oral if they can take orally or IV for 10 days, as just similar to what the study did. Um, and then we can consider um, remdesivir and convalescent plasma, um, uh, and we would get our infectious disease consultants on board for this to help us make this decision. Uh, we'll discuss a little bit more about this uh, towards the end. And most importantly, anticoagulation to everyone um, who's admitted. So for the for the medicine, uh, for anyone on the medicine floor, uh, we have a, a, an algorithm which was developed for all patients here. Uh, and one of the first things, so all admitted patients receive thromboprophylaxis, regardless of COVID or not COVID, unless there's a contraindication such as bleeding. So we very commonly check um, D-dimer as an inflammatory marker when someone comes in. This will help us actually decide on uh, anticoagulation as well. So if the D-dimer is less than 1500 and there is no clinical suspicion for, uh, for uh, 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 VTE, you just continue the standard um, standard dosing. However, if you're, if you have if it's less than fifteen hundred, but you have a clinical suspicion based on profound hypoxemia, asymmetric leg edema, uh, you order an ultrasound. You order, also order an ultrasound if the D dimer is greater than fifteen hundred. Um, if there is a from VTE, you do full dose anticoagulation. But if there is not, you 
then go on to the intermediate dose of prophylaxis, which is anoxaparin or lovenox, uh, 0.5 milligrams per kg twice daily. Obviously, if we find something, you continue full dose anticoagulation. Um, if the study is not technically possible for various reasons uh, or the ultrasound is equivocal, you can also consider uh, empiric full dose anticoagulation, keeping in mind the risks and benefits for, the, for that particular patient. Um, this is just the standard weight-based dosing. And most recently, there is a, rec a recommendation, there is, there's something for post-discharge thromboprophylaxis for those who, uh, for those patients with COVID-19 who are discharged home, especially those who had prolonged ICU stays or ongoing mobility issues on discharge, you can consider low dose anticoagulation for two to four weeks, but this is something we would, um, you would want to discuss with the patient um, before doing. Uh, there's no strong recommendation, but it's something that's, that's been mentioned. Um, I'll just hand over to um, Salim, who will continue the rest of this um, discussion. Good morning, everyone. My name is Salem. I'm a third year internal medicine resident. I'll be talking about uh, management of uh, acute hypoxemic respiratory failure in COVID patients. So again, even in the ICU, the cornerstone of management of COVID-induced uh, lung injury is supportive care. Uh, so with our supportive care, we usually aim to keep the saturation above 92, 94% and uh, to um, um, make sure that the patient saturation is above this level, we can use uh, the high flow nasal cannula uh, up to like uh, 50 or 60 liters with 100% oxygen. And this is like a well-tolerated uh, um, modality to provide oxygen to these patients. It's also uh, um, like uh, uh, the patient will feel like comfortable on, on this high flow. Uh, we can also ask the patient if they cannot maintain uh, the oxygenation, like the O2 sat of more than 92, we can ask them to uh, do the prone positioning. Uh, we have a protocol for that and we have an order set. I'll be talking about this later on. Uh, in some patients, we might consider uh, some non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Uh, one of the modalities that we can use is the helmet CPAP, which can provide uh, 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 some positive pressure. Uh, with this helmet CPAP, uh, I'll show it to you. It's like a box. Uh, we'll see it around the patient's head with an inflow of oxygen and outflow. Uh, this will also give some pressure. Actually, it's well tolerated by the patients because uh, it's, I would say it's more comfortable than the uh, usual face mask that we use in the uh, <clears throat> usual CPAP. It also decreases the risk of aspiration in case of vomiting. Uh, and in some patients, we might consider uh, using BiPAP. Uh, the use of BiPAP in a pure hypoxemic respiratory failure actually is still controversial. Uh, it's, in some study, it showed that it's beneficial in patients with combined COVID plus COPD, uh, but not for just hypoxia. Uh, if the patient continues to worsen and they develop like a full uh, blown ARD as uh, this case, we will uh, 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 consider intubation. Uh, the ARDS definition in COVID patients is, uh, 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 is as other diseases. It's like uh, uh, with, we need the three criteria. Uh, the first one is a PF ratio less than 300 with a PEEP of uh, five centimeter water or more. Uh, we also need uh, an acute development of these symptoms within, within a week of the clinical insult. And we also uh, need um, the bilateral opacities on chest imaging. Uh, uh, and I think Dr. O'Haran mentioned uh, uh, these in his talk. Uh, in the management of, of the patients are intubated and uh, uh, for ARDS secondary to COVID, we usually follow the ARDS net criteria. Uh, I'll be talking about this later on. Uh, and if they continue to worsen, even uh, following the ARDS net criteria, we will consider uh, a neuromuscular blockage like paralysis, uh, prone positioning, and uh, also the use of inhaler, uh, inhaled vasodilators, nitric oxide and flolan. Uh, and in the refractory cases, if the patients are not responding to all of these, uh, one of the options that we can consider is VV ECMO. 
so this is uh, the order set that we use for uh, awake proning. Um, you know, if you see, uh, it's like uh, we will ask the patient to uh, uh, do multiple positioning uh, that will be changed every two hours. The first one is left lateral recumbent, and uh, then uh, right lateral recumbent, then uh, sitting upright for uh, 60 to 90 degree, then we'll ask them to lie uh, prone in bed. Uh, uh, we should be cautious if the patient on CPAP because uh, this increased the risk of uh, the CPAP might get <clears throat> disconnected with changing the position. One of the things we also to keep in mind that you cannot force the patient to do this position um, because you know some patient will be comfortable doing it, but some patient will not. But we usually try our best to make it as comfortable as possible. Uh, I already talked about this. Uh, so regarding the uh, ARDS net guideline uh, that we follow, you know, uh, uh, an ARDS patient, we uh, aim for a tidal volume between less than six usually four to six uh, cc per uh, kg ideal body weight. Uh, we also aim to keep the plateau pressure less than 30 centimeter water and the driving pressure less than 15 uh, to decrease the risk of barotrauma and lung, uh, worsening lung, lung injury. Uh, our goal of the PAO2 is usually between 70 and 195, uh, which correspond to a saturation of 92 to 98%. And again, uh, in case if there is no improvement in oxygenation in all of these, we should consider proning positioning and uh, paralytics and VV ECMO and use of uh, inhaled vasodilators. Um, uh, you know, it's with ARDS, we deal with the ARDS in COVID patient as any other ARDS. So there is this uh, step up approach. We usually start with uh, uh, the tidal volume. We uh, keep going up with plateau, uh, oh, sorry, with PEEP, which uh, uh, essentially will increase the plateau pressure till uh, we uh, reach our goal. And keep in mind to watch for hypercapnia. Sometimes we can allow for uh, permissive hypercapnia. Uh, but we should keep it in mind. And if the patient continues to worsen, again, we can use the paralytics, we can use prone positioning. And uh, at the end, if, if, if the uh, uh, patient develops a severe hypoxia resistant, we will consider uh, VV ECMO. Uh, there are studies that mentioned uh, uh, like uh, um, various types of ARDS. Uh, so generally speaking, ARDS, the hallmark of ARDS is stiffening of the lung, where the compliance will be very uh, uh, low. So that's why the treatment is usually requiring uh, giving these patients high PEEP to maintain uh, oxygenation because with high PEEP, you will recruit more alveoli. Uh, so some studies uh, recently published saying that in COVID patients, uh, the compliance might be preserved. So you will see like a picture of ARDS that actually with giving them like a, a small PEEP, the, uh, the uh, 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 oxygenation will improve. Uh, again, this is theoretical uh, uh, and we, we encourage to uh, treat COVID patients with ARDS as the usual ARDS protocol. But if you notice that their uh, compliance is not as usual, uh, just keep it in mind that uh, in some patients, in, in, in the subset of, of uh, uh, these patients, the compliance might be preserved. Uh, so the ventilator setting uh, uh, might need to be changed. Uh, this is here. So uh, usually these patients, we notice that they require long, longer duration of intubation than other ARDS. And actually we start thinking of uh, um, doing tracheostomy after three weeks of intubation. Uh, but you know, a tracheostomy carries a high risk of uh, aerosolization, which increases the risk of uh, uh, spread of the virus. So make sure that the COVID test is negative before uh, considering tracheostomy. And if you are doing it at bedside, like with percutaneous uh, tracheostomy, uh, uh, do it under negative pressure room uh, rather than like a, a, a regular room. Uh, for regarding the anticoagulation, uh, since these patients are in the ICU, uh, these are at higher risk of uh, uh, um, 
uh, of thromboembolic diseases uh, because of the COVID and because of uh, ICU uh, stay. So uh, if we have an evidence of VTE, DVT, PE, consider a full dose and coagulation. But if uh, there is no evidence of VTE disease, I consider uh, intermediate dose. What I mean by intermediate dose is any dose equivalent to uh, enoxaparin, 0.5 milligram per uh, kg twice daily, which is half of the dose of the therapeutic uh, uh, um, enoxaparin. Um, I will uh, hand it uh, uh, to Dr. Sondi to talk about ECMO in this patient. So Dr. Cameron Hall, um, our interventional cardiologist, uh, made these slides and he was going to present it. Uh, he actually had a high risk terror case this morning and uh, oh, he just joined I'm in. Here. So he's here right on time. Go ahead, start. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, great. Uh, so I've been asked to just give a couple slides on ECMO and COVID. Um, next slide, please. So for those of you that have never really seen ECMO, uh, there's two types. Um, Extracorporeal membrane oxygenation is a method of removing carbon dioxide and oxygenating the patient um, and uh, breathing for the patient and resting the lungs. Uh, on the left of your screen, you can see a very um, simple schematic of the mechanism and how it works. We launched this program at Rochester Regional in 2017 in the fall and, and have steadily grown with, uh, as has quite international, uh, other countries and um, and other programs. You can see that in the top right-hand corner of your screen is the first ECMO uh, applied to a patient uh, remotely in 1971. Uh, and since then, it has steadily grown. It, it initially was used for neonates, uh, but we've now applied it to adults. In the bottom right-hand of your screen, you can see that that's ECMO in the, in the 90s on an adult patient. Um, you can see how complex and complicated it can be. Uh, next slide, please. Today, this is the technology we use. This is the cardio help. That's ECMO in a box. Um, and you can see on the left-hand side of your screen, cannulation in uh, the cardiac cath lab, uh, placing a patient on um, uh, ECMO. Uh, uh, forward, please. Um, it's, the technology has gotten so advanced that patients are now can be awake uh, and can be ambulatory. Next slide. And here's another patient uh, who's awake uh, and on ECMO. Um, next slide, yeah. There's two types of ECMO, like I mentioned. There's VA ECMO and there's VV ECMO. Uh, uh, when we speak of COVID, uh, we typically speak of VV ECMO. The majority of patients who have needed ECMO have all been put on VV ECMO for respiratory support. Uh, they have not needed cardiac support. Uh, VA ECMO is usually reserved for patients who have cardi cardiopulmonary failure. VV ECMO is primarily reserved for respiratory failure. Uh, next slide. And typically, this is how we cannulate a patient when we place them on VV ECMO. There's a very large cannula that comes up through the common femoral vein. Uh, we place it into the uh, proximal uh, IVC just below the right atrium, typically at the hepatic vein, and the inflow cannula into the right atrium coming through the right IJ. Uh, so the blood enters, the IVC goes to a pump, gets pumped through an oxygenator, where the gas is exchanged, uh, carbon dioxide is removed, oxygen is uh, um, uh, supplied, and the oxygenated blood is pumped back into the right atrium, and we rely on the myocardium to pump blood through the lung fields and out into the body. Next slide. The uh, leading uh, organization for ECMO is ELSO, uh, Extracorporal Life Support Organization. They're based out of Australia. And you can see these are the total runs since the uh, 1980s uh, of how many uh, patients have been uh, put on uh, pump for various reasons. Um, in the left-hand column, you can see neonatal. You can see the total runs have far surpassed adult because that was the patient population that it was applied to first. In the last decade, you can see uh, in, the, in the bottom, uh, the adult applications of ECMO has increased significantly. Uh, the pulmonary applications in the last decade or so has been 24,000, cardiac 25,000. What I want to draw your attention to is the survival rates. In the right-hand column, pulmonary application of ECMO carries a 60% survival rate. Uh, in cardiac applications, 43% survival rate. Now, it, it must be said that those are not the best survival rates, but without ECMO, these patients have a zero survival rate. So that's a significant increase uh, in survival with the application of VV ECMO or VA ECMO. Um, yeah, for those who are interested, uh, at the very bottom, you can see, see uh, ECPR. Uh, back one slide, please. 
eCPR is technically uh, cannulation while the patient is receiving CPR. Uh, you can see that the survival rates are very poor. Um, it's not a surprise. Uh, we have not been able to do a lot with it to improve those numbers. So we are very reserved when we apply ECMO in the setting of CPR. Just a quick comment on survival. So this is 30% of the patients who pretty much would have died. And Correct. for pulmonary cases, the 60% survive. Those are the patients we probably would have given up because we couldn't manage their hypoxia. So 60% of people who otherwise would definitely have died is a pretty good number. Correct. So next slide, please. And you can see that this is the total volume of cases uh, since 1990. Um, and you can see, uh, forward slide please, uh, you can see that there's a major trial that uh, emerged in 2009. It was the first attempt at performing a randomized controlled trial to apply ECMO and ARDS. Um, and uh, since that time, it was actually equivocal, uh, but since that time, the use of ECMO has increased. Uh, forward again. And most recently, the EOLIA trial, uh, that, which came out in 2018, was another attempt at a randomized controlled trial to demonstrate the benefits of uh, ECMO which also was equivocal. Uh, neither of these trials really demonstrated a benefit, but we continue to show that ECMO continues to rise and we do have anecdotal uh, and case-based reports of success. Forward slide. So uh, as uh, ECMO applies to COVID, uh, the leading research right now is a real-time data registry that also uh, has uh, spearheaded uh, as, as said before, it's based out of Australia, but you can see based on, on, on those numbers, the total runs, the majority of the runs in the registry are out of the United States. Um, we at this center are also a part of this registry, uh, but our volumes certainly have not been that high to contribute very much, but the majority of the cases that we see uh, uh, have come out of the United States. Uh, the Italians, when they had their pandemic, they did not apply a lot of ECMO, um, as you can be, uh, as you can might understand, is ECMO is a uh, resource-intensive uh, technology, um, and when their staffing was sparse, they could not apply a lot of ECMO to their patients. Uh, the similar scenario was applied in New York City, but uh, they were not very as reserved as the Italians. Forward. Uh, this is a good summary of the data. If you're interested, you can have access to this data yourself. It's on the website, elso.org. But you can see in the left-hand column that the average age of the patient is typically about 49 years old. The majority of them have been male, and the majority of them have been, have been heavy. Uh, the applications of ECMO, you can see that 95% of the time it's been VV ECMO for respiratory failure. Um, and uh, very few patients had to convert from VV to VA as the myocardium was affected. Uh, the uh, mortality uh, on the right-hand side of your screen, uh, in the middle box, you can see that if about 54% of patients were discharged alive. So a little bit less than what we would expect with typical ARDS. Uh, the duration of hospital stay was roughly 29 days. Uh, and the other aspect of this that was interesting in the top right-hand corner, you can see that the biggest comorbidity patients had that required a BV ECMO was the fact that they were obese. So 50% of patients that were put on BV ECMO and respiratory failure were obese. Forward slide, yeah. So at Rochester Regional, uh, we select patients for VV ECMO based on uh, certain criteria, ARTSNET criteria and requirements for uh, hypoxic respiratory failure. Um, but the uh, VV ECMO application only has to be for respiratory failure. If you have cardiopulmonary failure, VA is the better technology or the better application of this technology. Um, you, the requirements are that we uh, supply or uh, provide uh, conventional uh, respiratory support, uh, intubation. Um, they have to fail proning, they have to fail paralytics. Mm -hmm. And the uh, application of VV ECMO can only be applied for patients that have reversible lung pathology. So in COVID-19, we believe it to be uh, a reversible lung pathology that the lung uh, can recover from this infection. Um, VV ECMO does not treat the disease. So although we apply VV ECMO for patients and support them through the process, we still have to treat them uh, with medicines and steroids for their lung disease. Uh, they still need ventilatory support, but we do um, minimal vent settings as to uh, allow the lungs to rest. Uh, and as you can see, some examples we've done in the past has been previous ARDS, severe pneumonia, COPD, uh, status asthmaticus, and other types of lung pathologies. Forward slide. 
uh, our selection process uh, is uh, an amalgamation or a, a blend of the uh, requirements that uh, various institutions have already applied. It also has some recommendations. Uh, these uh, you see on your screen are from UPMC in, in the Cleveland Clinic. They actually use a Murphy score, which is the bottom box. Uh, we have not gone so far to actually uh, use this scoring mechanism. Next slide. These are the uh, ECMO uh, candidacy uh, selection criteria for our patients. They have to be less than 65 um, or 65 to 75 years old with the possibility of L LVAD or um, high likelihood of recovery uh, uh, for more than one year. They have to be fully anticoagulated and they have to have full neurological recovery. Um, our exclusion criteria are uh, greater than the age of 75, stage four cancer, they're actively bleeding, strokes, uh, they have a platelet count less than 100,000, they have vascular disease that prevents us from cannulating the patient, any contraindication to anticoagulation, any contraindication to receiving blood products, or the lung injury is irreversible and they're not a candidate for transplant, for example, interstitial lung disease. Forward slide. Okay, thank you. That's it. So I think we are done with time. So we had a couple of slides on uh, data on dexamethasone, remdesivir, and convalescent plasma. We'll skip those. Um, uh, Teja, could you just go to the last slide? And I think we should give a few minutes for questions and answers. Um, just the last one. Um, next. It's pretty impressive that we had an outcome that was substantially better than what we had expected for these patients with rather severe respiratory failure. Right. Yeah. So there were some questions sent. I will like to answer one of them. There was a question if we should be doing PFDs uh, in these patients after recovery. The general answer is no. Uh, if patient is not symptomatic and is not having any issues after they have recovered, there is no indication to do PFDs. Um, who gets fibrosis, we still don't know. Uh, at least for now, uh, so far, we have not seen any patients in pulmonary clinic uh, as part of complications from COVID. Uh, there are some news, there are some reports coming up that patients may end up uh, having fibrosis. Uh, PFTs in general is a high risk procedure, so we avoid doing it unless absolutely necessary uh, and definitely not when they are COVID positive. You can stop sharing the screen, by the way. Yeah, you can go to the last uh, with the hospital data, the, the RRH uh, oh, okay. toolkit, just to show. Yeah, so this is pretty much summary of the whole presentation. It's available on toolkit uh, under management if somebody's interested. And then, yes, you can stop sharing. And uh, did you had any other questions, Dr. Patrick? I didn't. So there was one question about uh, is physical conditioning and chronic exercise a factor in developing respiratory failure? I know um, um, very little in the way of comorbidity. And so do you think that? I don't know the answer, but generally speaking, if you are deconditioned, you do poorly in any, uh, any acute diseases. So other than that, um, uh, I don't, um, yeah, comorbidities most commonly, as we saw, seen were morbid obesity, asthma, COPD. Yeah. And these patients will be severely deconditioned by the time they recover, especially the ones who are coming to ICU. Yeah. No, I think we're just about out of time, but I want to, you know, give special commendation to our folks in the ICU for their superb management of these patients during a very difficult time. And the outcomes speak for themselves. Uh, you guys have done a fantastic job uh, at a very difficult time. So hopefully there will be no second wave, but if there is, I, I know we have the right people in the ICU to take care of these patients. Um, so thank you very much. Very nice presentation. And I think I'm going to stop it here.